Live from the KIJU studios in beautiful Ogasawara, this is the Monster Island Film Vault, episode 39, The Drifters vs. Gamera vs. Virus. Hello, Kaiju lovers, and welcome to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu. I am your host, Monster Island's very own film curator, Nate Marchand. And joining me today, I have not one, but two of the drifters from the Drift Space podcast. Here on my right is the Kaiju fandom's favorite, or least favorite, depending on who you talk to, Trigger Man, Jack G-Man Hudgens. <laughs> Hello. A <laughs> uh, returning guest, I might add. Yes, Jimmy, much to your chagrin. Yeah, he's just another member of your ever-expanding rogues gallery at this point. Just not on his wall. <laughs> I have not let him live down that bar fight. I'm just saying. <laughs> it wasn't a bar fight. Oh. It insinuates that he was ha- any upper hand whatsoever at any point in time. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. He had to pay for it because he had to go fetch the building that you accidentally ejected over onto the Japanese coastline. Was that me or him? A lot was going on at the time. There's a lot of accidentals. <laughs> oh, come on, J- Jimmy. Don't be rude trying to interrupt Jack. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, I thought you had something there. Mike. No, I, 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 no, no rebuttal here. No rebuttal. Yeah, stop interrupting me, jerk, <laughs> jerk face. <laughs> yes. And then here on my left is one of his illustrious cohorts. The man who walked up to cancer and kicked it in the balls like the Power Rangers did Ivan Ooze, J.R. Villers. <laughs> that was a pretty powerful kick, I gotta say. For four years old, watching that cancer fly into space was just... Wow. <laughs> The image of him like kicking himself in the head <laughs> so hard <laughs> that this like goo like cancerous thing flies out of the back of his face. It's just kind of like it's just fantastic. actually kind of just there. I was like, guys, just cut me open. I'll take care of the rest. And I just kind of face planted myself with my foot. It was, it was impressive. Uh, Jimmy's wondering if there was a comet involved, just like in the movie. <laughs> You know, the comment was more of a metaphor for, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just more impressed you were limber enough to get your foot up to your face, JR. That's that's the... Especially at four well, years know, old. I was sickly enough that I just had limber bones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave that one alone. I'm not... Yeah. I can make cancer jokes because I had it. I... <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> uh, we're uh, we're going to be getting into plenty of uh, jokes like that with today's movie. Hmm. Yeah, today's movie where we are continuing the year of. Camera. Fun. Although I have to admit the fun is starting to wear off. Either that or it's starting to increase because the Stockholm Syndrome is settling in. I'm not sure. I mean, I've been doing this for four months at this point. I had that wonderful mountain of Godzilla with King of the Monsters and GVK, and now I'm back into the Gamera Valley. I'm just saying. I mean, you know, four <laughs> movies in four months. I mean, you've had a month reprieve since the last one, so. Yeah, except now I have to do two in a row, so. Ah, uh-huh. because <laughs> I'm required like to do a one a month. Mm-hmm. Year of Gamera, twelve movies, twelve months. All right, here, here's one for you. What What do you and Jimmy like more, uh, Virus or Euron? Well, obviously, Jimmy, you love Virus because apparently this was a very exciting chapter of your life. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, that is true. Apparently, the board in some of their publications got your name wrong because your name is actually Jimmy Crane, and they called you Jimmy Morgan because that's what it said on (laughs) on Wikipedia, and the board didn't bother to fact check it. Oh, that makes sense. Your mother's maiden name was Morgan. Mm -hmm, I get it now. Mm -hmm. 
it's all piecing together. By the yeah. way, Jimmy, I enjoyed meeting your mother so much this time. Oh, uh, she just inspired <laughs> so much feeling <laughs> and torment. Ah, uh, I was so so touched. Uh, uh, Where uh, were you touched? <laughs> We're not going there. This is a family show. <laughs> the cancer. <laughs> but uh, here's yeah. a doll. Can you point to me where? <laughs> <laughs> ah. Moving on. So, how did you guys get to the island today? Was it Jimmy? Did he bring you here, or did you guys find it, some other cockamamie? You know, after way? listening to the show for a while, I do not trust Jimmy way with the transporter. I don't want a female version of myself walking around up there. <laughs> yeah, trust me, it's weird enough already. Uh, you might might actually go on a tour with her after we're done here. Oh, dear Lord. But we were actually testing out our own Jaeger. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, not many people know this, but we're kind of into hero worship. <laughs> so half of the Jaeger was the White Ranger and the other half of it was Godzilla, which is a very interesting combination. I'm uh, trying to picture what the, you have to show me this. I must yeah. see this now. <laughs> well, you know, he's in the docking bay. After we're done with this, we can go take a look. Uh, apparently jimmy is demanding that it be added to his garage immediately jimmy no <laughs> i don't want you having this power <laughs> not many of us do i think With but the way he handles his liquor i don't think it's a good <laughs> idea <laughs> yeah last thing we need is uh, for jimmy to get a dui and a giant robot i mean he's already got mechanicong mark ii which that was interesting. Speaking of drunk driving, he did try to get into a fist fight. That was a great idea with a uh, drunk Kong after the GVK premiere here on the island. So, yeah. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. <sighs> yeah, that went about as well as you would expect. <laughs> hmm. As to answer your question earlier, Jack, I honestly, I am, I, I'm a little bit torn. I'm, I can't really decide. I mean, I, Giron is probably a bit more entertaining because of how zany it is, but we'll get into that here once we uh, dive into the episode proper. Because yes, kaiju lovers, we are talking about Gamera versus Virus today. And Jimmy is obviously super excited about this. But uh, before we can get to that, I am contractually obligated to read Jimmy's entertaining info dump to get everyone up to speed about what we're talking about. And then after I do that and we discuss the film, we'll be getting into today's Toku topic, which is about the only thing you can talk about of any sort of substance related to this movie, which would be the Scout Association of Japan. <laughs> yes, Jimmy, I know you used to be part of it. Good for you. All right, gentlemen, are you ready? Let's do this. <laughs> Gamera is the benevolent and often playful friend to all children. He protects Earth from alien invaders and fights to save the child protagonist from the Virassians. However, he is briefly mind-controlled by the aliens and made to attack Japan, using weaponized stock footage. The cruel and tyrannical virus is the squid-like commander of the alien invaders. He's at first human-sized, but in the movie's final moments, he grows gigantic by absorbing his crewmates in a desperate act to kill Gamera. His goal is to take over the world, of course, because Earth is similar to his homeworld. The Kennys in this movie are the smart and mischievous Masao Nakaya and Jim Crane, a.k.a. my intrepid producer, Jimmy from NASA. These tech-savvy Boy Scouts befriend Gamera while piloting a yellow submarine. When later captured by the Virassians, the boys seek to escape their captors or sabotage their ship to help Gamera and allow the military to attack the invaders. Mr. Shimida is the cool-headed and firm Scoutmaster who mentors the boys and later advises them on how to escape the Virassians. The slightly overbearing but kind Mariko Nakaya, Junko Aoki, and Masako Shibata are scout leaders supervising the boys during the jamboree, with Mariko worrying about her brother so much she actually consults with the JSDF on how to respond to the Virassians. She also uses a wristwatch radio to communicate with her brother to keep track of him. While the human and kaiju plotlines are at first separate, once Masao and Jim meet Gamera, the plotlines are unified. The earlier human scenes serve mostly as foreshadowing and exposition for when the plot lines converge, at which point Gamera and Virus become the primary motivators for the protagonists. Virus and his fellow aliens are the problem. Gamera destroys a Virassian ship that approaches Earth, but not before it sends a signal to its home planet. A second ship is soon dispatched. 
After the super catch ray dissipates and the Virassians scan Gamera's mind, Gamera pursues the ship, but the aliens capture Masao and Jim and use them as leverage against Gamera. They then attach a mind control device to Gamera and send him to attack Japan. Jim and Masao try to free Virus from a cage thinking he is a prisoner, but they are captured. With the boys as hostages, the aliens force the United Nations to surrender. However, the boys free themselves and figure out how to reverse the ship's controls, breaking the mind control on Gamera and escaping the ship with the super catch ray. Gamera attacks the ship and it crashes. Virus decapitates his crewmates and merges with them to grow kaiju-sized. The problem is solved by Gamera. He flies Virus into the upper atmosphere, freezing him, and lets the alien monster fall into the ocean, where he dissolves. The script by Showa series regular Nissan Takahashi is a simple, almost fairy tale like story focused on a pair of protagonists with a handful of adult supporting characters. Despite Gamera vs. Gauss being the highest grossing movie in the series so far, director Noriaki Yuasa was given a budget of only 20 million yen, or about $56,000, for this movie. This was one-third the budget of Gauss, and it shows. This was the first Gamera movie to utilize stock footage, including black and white scenes from Gamera the Giant Monster, to save money and pad out the runtime. The filmmakers also had to redress the Virassian ship to create the illusion of a bigger production, although this is actually clever and makes sense in-universe. Soup maker Masao Tagi said Virus was the most impressive monster he created for the Gamera series because it was difficult to make and challenging to implement. Other techniques used throughout the film include back projection, miniatures, and pyrotechnics. The production quality of the new footage is close to being on par with the previous Gamera movies. This is a lighthearted kids movie with just enough gravitas to take the alien invaders seriously as threats. In light of this, despite its science fiction trappings, it's closer to a fantasy film. This is experimental as a Gamera movie in that it introduces alien invaders to the series and veers into a more dreamlike, fantastical style and tone. Even so, it recycles many of the tropes seen in other kaiju Ega at the time. For these reasons, it's an expansion of style for the Gamera series. Alien Invaders would be the villains in three of the next four Gamera movies, and the series would continue to become more outlandish and surreal with its monsters and stories. It was also the first to feature American actors in the original Japanese cut, which would become a staple for the next several entries. The movie was made to cash in on the massive success of Gamera vs. Gauss. With Daie struggling financially and the budget slashed, Yuasa expected this to be the final Gamera movie, so he poured his heart and soul into it. It was also intended to appeal to a broader international audience to drum up interest in Japanese films. It was meant to entertain the series' core child audience. Box office figures are unavailable, but it was a surprise hit when released in Japan March 20th, 1968. In June 1968, a subtitled version played alongside Yokai Monster Spook Warfare in Honolulu, Hawaii. It then began airing on syndicated television in the continental United States in 1970 under the title Destroy All Planets. It has received lukewarm reviews from critics, but it has remained fairly popular with kaiju fans, many of whom insist it and the rest of the Showa Gamera series should be reevaluated. It has a 4.6 with 1,370 ratings on IMDb. Three cuts of the movie exist, but the only differences are the amount of stock footage utilized during the Virassian's brain scan of Gamera. Due to its low budget, the original theatrical version ran 72 minutes with the brain scan stock footage lasting three minutes. However, with AIP TV's involvement, this sequence was padded out to 18 minutes with whole fight scenes from the previous two films dumped into it to bring it to 90 minutes to fit into a two-hour TV time slot with commercials. This cut was released by Daae on Laserdisc in 1986 as, quote-unquote, the uncut 90-minute version. When it was re-released on Laserdisc in 1991, though, Yuasa supervised an intermediary 81-minute version, mostly excising footage from Gamera vs. Gauss. The dub was produced by Titan Productions, a.k.a. Titra Productions, who had previously dubbed Gamera Double M The Invincible. The infamous international dub commissioned on the cheap by Daie has seen many releases by bargain bin VHS and DVD producers. There aren't many forces at play in this movie. Masao and Jim often find themselves at odds with adults and aliens who underestimate their capabilities and write them off as mere children. 
The Virassians are colonialists and supremacists who see Earth as theirs and all other races as quote-unquote useless, which naturally clashes with humanity's right to exist. The Virassians use mind control technology to force the now friendly Gamera to do their bidding. That's about it. There are a handful of themes. Masao and Jim use cleverness to outwit the Virassians and sabotage their ship to help Gamera. They are willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of humanity. Their wonder at everything from the yellow submarine to Gamera is presented in a positive light. Their friendship implicitly endorses international understanding and speaks against racism, with Masao being Japanese and Jim being American. Also, Gamera's friendship with children is celebrated. The Virassians' aforementioned supremacism is portrayed as evil and leads to their downfall. I'm contractually obligated to say we will now discuss a dramatization of an exciting chapter of Jimmy from NASA's life with some toku talk. Well, this is going to be interesting because at the last second, JR, apparently the board decided to give us options about which version of this movie to watch because there's three versions of it. And I, having to watch the 90-minute version with the commentary as part of my research, said, you know what? I will take the small mercy of watching the theatrical version. And you joined in with me, but Jack over here, being the weirdo, decided I'm going to watch the director's version. And then he went to that. So uh, we'll be getting some different perspectives here, apparently. So we'll see how that goes. But this is definitely no Snyder Cut, just to let all of you know. (laughs) (laughs) know, I love how, because according to my research, apparently when the movie aired on television, they were trying to bill it as like the uncut 90-minute version, which is not true. (laughs) 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 You know where the 90 minutes comes from? Padding from stock footage. Good (laughs) grief. There's tons of that. Yes, because the 90-minute version, it goes on for freaking ever. (laughs) Uh, I know people in the kaiju fandom give Godzilla's revenge grief about (laughs) having stock footage, but I'm like, I'm sorry. The way it's handled in these later Gamera movies, which is why I've been dreading when she got to this half of the Showa series, it's just... It is so belligerently padding. (laughs) And it's just lazy as far as I care. I mean, they are literally just dropping whole fight scenes into the middle of this movie with the flimsy justification of the alien invaders scanning Gamera's brain to figure out his weaknesses. (laughs) (laughs) At least in the theatrical version, that's only maybe what? Three minutes, Jr. as opposed to twenty. Like that. <laughs> yeah, no, they're just like, hey, let's control his brain. <laughs> All right, <laughs> moving on. Yeah, we need to figure out how to capture him when we've already captured him. <laughs> I mean, they say like it only it. lasts for fifteen minutes, or like some crazy almighty invaders you are. But <laughs> <laughs> right, let's use the kids. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then the world <laughs> nearly surrenders because of yeah, two let's kids. See, let's I mean. Cut- I mean, come on, come on, come on, two kids. Has the UN (laughs) never heard Spock's famous bit of advice needs of the many? I'm just saying. (laughs) Even the kids are like, guys, there's like two of us and there's like millions of you. They we'll only take watch one Star- for the team. They only watch Star Trek Three, though, where the, the Kirk <laughs> says the needs of the one that way, <laughs> the needs of the many. Uh, yes. Uh jeez. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so what was uh, your experience like, Jack, watching the middle ground director's version? Yeah, you know, it kind of makes me want to at least sit through portions of the U.S. edit <laughs> just to see. Wait. It's even longer. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, it's funny because JR and I, we just had a discussion about the Snyder Cut on our show. And one of my big problems was that the movie could have been cut down by about an hour and a half. <laughs> I think the Snyder Cut is just a better bad movie than the first theatrical cut bad movie that we got. There might be a good movie in there somewhere, but it just doesn't justify its runtime. So I'm watching the director's version, thinking to myself, you also, what were you thinking? Because the brisk 72-minute edit, the theatrical version, it works perfectly fine. 
And the amount of stock footage, unedited, I might add, <laughs> tossed at the wall here is just, I literally, and I, like you, I watched this film twice, once just for the film and uh, the second time I had the audio commentary on. And both times I'm thinking, well, I guess I can make a meal now. Maybe I can uh, <laughs> take out the garbage, but I can't unsplice this movie. So there's a lot of fun in this film. But man, does it just stop when the stock footage comes on. And it's not even that stock footage. It's the way it's edited. You also had the unfortunate task of being both the dramatic director and the special effects director. And this was unlike Toho, where mm -hmm. you had Honda and Tsuburaya, where mm -hmm. you had Fukuda and Arakawa, or later on Nakano. He was doing all this by himself. He probably shouldn't have been doing it all by himself because <laughs> unlike Nakano, <laughs> he can't edit this footage. I mean, think about how like it didn't work, but think about how genius the stock footage editing was and say Gigan. I got to admit, the stock footage that was used in Godzilla vs. Gaiken was integrated into the film pretty well, but at least it wasn't a 20-minute chunk. No, we got less than, like, one-minute chunks. Even if it did go over a minute, they were spliced into almost new scenes, essentially. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you would get a combination of Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, with Monster Zero and Nakano, and this didn't work. But it was a good idea. He tinted the footage to make it look like it was taking place during nightfall. And I don't think Godzilla vs. Gigant needed all that stock footage. And I don't think that the tinting thing worked. But it was more creative than essentially dumping an entire reel <laughs> in <laughs> camera versus virus. And and yeah. is it virus? Virus? I, I... <laughs> it is virus. I believe uh, Kiyotoshi on uh, Monsters vs. Men actually corrected them, said it was it was virus. Oh, okay. Well, then I've been saying and, it wrong this entire time. Oops. <laughs> and they, they said virus on the audio commentary as well. Yes. I just can't find anybody who agrees on how to say the dang thing's name. I've been saying virus all my life. It was only recently I discovered people were saying virus. And so I thought, well, that kind of sounds cooler, but I don't know if it's right. And I don't think it's right. So, yeah, I'm going with that. But... <laughs> Back to the stock footage thing. Mm -hmm. This was a film that had its budget cut by about a third mm -hmm. from the prior Gamera movies. Despite the so fact they, they that it was the, a huge hit, I might add. Gamera versus uh, right. Gauss was the highest grossing out of all of these Showa movies. Yeah, Gauss was fantastic. And they still cut it because they felt that the kaiju boom was kind of coming to an end. They weren't wrong with that foresight. We were seeing the Godzilla series come to a decline at this point as well. Toho had decided that Destroy All Monsters was going to be their last movie. And, you know, it, it, the the <laughs> the heyday was ending, essentially. It probably didn't help that Japanese cinema as a whole was facing a decline as well. And you'll get into this when you, especially when you hit Gamera versus Zegra. <laughs> but this, mm. this hits Dae particularly hard later on. So going to the theaters to see giant monsters slapping each other wasn't a draw anymore, <laughs> largely huh. thanks to Subaraya. Because of Ultraman and the television Ultraman. shows? Exactly. You could get this stuff at high quality effects, I might add, on television now. Higher quality than some of these gamma effects, I might. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, and... I, I will give this movie credit. It is clearly ambitious. We'll say that much, but it doesn't have the resources in order to realize its ambition. That's the problem. I'll give it credit. It's imaginative for sure. I mean, the alien spaceship looks like a bunch of bumblebees glued onto a friendship bracelet, but you know, we'll let that slide. <laughs> You know, I think I saw one of those when I was born hanging above my crib. <laughs> you can remember that far back? <laughs> Break colors. No, the thing hanging yeah, above if that my was crib the was case, a turtle shell with a squid sticking in it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good grief. Okay, since we're on that subject, the Gamma movies are known for their gratuitous violence. Good grief. The first time I watched this movie, I did not <laughs> expect the impaling. I don't know how Gamera survived that. A uh, half of his, if not more than half of his internal organs should have been external at that point. But <laughs> I got to give Gamera credit. 
he must be BA because he was able to fly upside down into the upper atmosphere with that space squid stabbed into him. And then he righted himself and spun around in one of the most surreal images in all of Kaiju filmdom. And then after he froze virus and then he fell down to the ocean and dissolved because apparently when you freeze the space squid, he's water soluble. <laughs> Got to give Virus at least a little bit of credit. He definitely spearheaded that. I'm I leaving. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> was I, I got so more well. where those came from. <laughs> I had no idea that scene was so popular. Because first of all, Iwasa received such... <laughs> this is horrible. The kids apparently liked all the blood and gore and whatnot from Gamera versus Gauss that he decided to go even further in this movie. He's like, yeah, let's give the kids what they want. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, oh, and goodness. The scene where Virus continues to just impale Gamera, essentially. <laughs> There's a Pez dispenser made out of this thing. Oh my gosh! That uh, I believe the actor who plays Jim said he owned in the commentary. Uh, some sort uh, of toy. Yes, Jimmy, Carl Craig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carl Craig. Yeah, who, uh, by the way, was miscredited on the English version. It says Curl Crean. <laughs> oh my gosh. Was, uh, this was the AIP? Yes. Right, okay. And apparently, so I for what, he, uh, I saw in one of the interviews on the Arrow Blu-ray set that in 1999, he went onto a website looking up stuff for Gamera because, you know, that's his thing. And he found a guy who was calling him Curl Crane. And he said, hey, by the way, I'm actually him and that's not my name. And the guy said, yeah, I don't believe you. And then, <laughs> then he sent him pictures from this scrapbook from the photographer who was on set taking pictures like, oh, crap, <laughs> you are him. <laughs> Well, that's funny. I wonder if the Sandy Frank dub of Gamma vs. Uh, Virus has that same. Uh, this doesn't have a spelling. Sandy Frank dub, actually. No, it doesn't, which is fine. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, yeah, because this is actually the first of these Gamera movies where my guests are not watching the MST3K version because this wasn't on MST3K. There were three Showa Gamera movies that were not on MST3K. This, Jiger, and Super Monster. <clears throat> wow. Well. You know what's funny? <clears throat> it, when I was thinking about it, the, the second time I went through this movie, I realized I had watched half of Gamera Super Monster. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So uh, going back to the whole stabbing scene, like this was apparently a very big scene that stuck with people in the movie. There was a toy made out of it where Gamera's head kept popping in and out of his <laughs> His, his shell whenever you pushed virus in, into it <laughs> and then apparently according to LeMay's book kids screamed in the theater during the scene yeah and how could I, they not it's just gruesome his yeah head is uh, popping uh, out every time let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a repeated stabbing for the kids for the kids. <laughs> he put this in for the kids. Yeah, and before that was another scene that I was not expecting in this movie the first time I watched it, which was, as Brandon Tenold says in his videos, decapitation! When... <laughs> Virus just takes all those guys' oh, heads takes off. Out their heads. Takes the heads off. I was like, the what heads are we off. I was not here? expecting that. And then, and then the kids are like, "Oh, they must have captured those humans and then used their bodies as disguises." Do you realize how terrifying that is? <laughs> <laughs> also, when did they find the time? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> when did they find the time to capture what was that? Like five sushi chefs and. <laughs> <laughs> and then gut them and use their skins, like stuff themselves in there somehow, because the anatomy definitely doesn't match. I'm just saying. I have to say, though, the concept, like how creepy it is, is very Ultra Q. It is a bit Ultra Q. It, it, and it seems like something that the like Ultra Q or follow up Ultra Man series yes. might do. Like, oh, these. Well, uh, walking around with lit up eyes and whatnot. <laughs> now that was <laughs> freaky. Human. I will give credit where credit is due. The eyes were freaky. The eyes were actually probably one of my favorite parts. Yeah. I loved them. 
And I will say, the way the aliens are handled in this is actually pretty good. I mean, it's a little weird at first that the aliens are just voices on a computer and we don't see them, but I think that helps to build some mystery. And then when we see them and they look human, then they don't seem so alien. And then we yeah. see the eyes, which makes them more menacing. And then we see Virus in a cage, which, why the heck was he in a cage? I don't understand that at all. That was like his chair on the bridge, essentially. Yeah, but why is it a cage? <laughs> and then he's like, oh, yeah, I'm a captured animal. I'm a. Right? You know, that was I'm, the part so I was what, confused I was like, about. Is he, I was like, is he doing oh, if we it? set him free, he'll be yeah. helpless. He's like, yeah, of course yeah, I will. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, so is he, uh, is he lying to the kids so that he can manipulate them? That makes sense. Or I even had this crazy idea in my head that maybe the rest of the crew, even though he's the commander, it seems, put him in the cage because they're genuinely afraid of him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he does lob off their heads at the end, so... Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, but then he can get out of the cage by himself. Yeah. So, you know, I yeah. don't know. It's one of those peculiar things in kaiju film, Tokusatsu, where you just kind of have to roll with it. It seems to me that he was trying to win their trust or get information out of them, Which is essentially. J just kind of strange, and uh, there's a lot of things that happen with these aliens that's a little bit bizarre. Here's some more uh -huh. Star Trek connections for you. Did you notice that when those kids first get on there, the aliens basically ignore them until they think they're a threat suddenly? So, like, what are you, Thank the you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> we're like, oh, look, Earth children. We will do nothing about them. Oh, wait, they're actually getting into stuff? Now we care. <laughs> Oh, wait, they want a gun? Yeah, maybe we should do something about oh, that. Oh, yeah, guns that are literally toys w uh, with beer cans uh, glued to the front uh -huh. and painted. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. They bought these, like, little... What was the ray gun, co the, the toy called? Uh, I have it in my notes. Give me a second. It's a uh, jet something. Uh, JR, jet what launcher. They, what they essentially, jet yeah, launcher. jet launcher. What they essentially did, they painted over these toys that they bought, and to make them look a little more alien, painted and glued these these beer cans. <laughs> Onto the front. Make I mean, I, like I assume that, but like, I just <laughs> laughed when they're like, oh, we can't let you guys have anything dangerous. And it's cut to a wide shot and they're all holding like AK 47s. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and funny enough, Carl Craig still has one of them in his little uh, prop collection. Yeah. I, uh, yes, Jimmy, I know. All of the props that Mr. Craig has, you have the real things. Good for you. <laughs> hmm. I really enjoyed the sets to the spaceship. Yeah, you know, I will give them credit. Oh. What's interesting about the spaceship sets is that it's a sign of the budget, but they found a really interesting way to work with that because uh -huh. it was just one set that they kept constantly redressing for different scenes which you can tell. And then the funny thing is it actually kind of works with the design of the spaceship because, like I said, they just look like five bumblebees glued to a friendship bracelet. So I'm guessing each of those compartments probably looks exactly the same. It just serves a different function. Well, they keep mentioning this is the only room that's safe in, like, one scene. And they all have a different color. They did an excellent job at redressing them. Yes, they I did. did. In mm -hmm. terms of lighting and the lights in the background and whatnot. And I just love how alien they look. They kind of remind me of, and yeah, I can't remember if you watched this movie with me, Planet of the Vampires. Yes. There's definitely some Star Trek influence in these sets, but like Planet of the Vampires is really where I was gravitating toward when I was watching this movie. Due to just the wide open spaces, there's not a whole lot there. And it just feels very alien because of mm -hmm. how like bare and it apparently kind of these aliens love kaleidoscopes and triangles. <laughs> but, a, well, but, course, but, despite, but also, apparently, as we learned in this movie, both Jimmy over there and his best friend Masao, you two still keep in touch? Oh, that's good to know. Oh, that's unfortunate. You didn't get invited to the Gamera banquet a few months ago, but all the other Gamera kids did. I'm sure you were angry. But, but... All of that well, to say, they sabotage a submarine and apparently invent the Apple Watch before Apple does. And that somehow helps them figure out how to sabotage an alien spaceship. <laughs> well, why not? <sighs> this is when the Gamera series started doing the precocious children. <laughs> this is when people really started getting annoyed with these movies. Because these kids, I mean, they're not, these two, credit to you, Jimmy, these kids are not unbearable, I will say that. But good grief, they're figuring stuff out better than adults. <laughs>
I love but, how they sabotage the submarine, and then their reward for sabotaging the submarine is, hey, let, why don't we let these kids drive it? <laughs> yeah, that was... Which, by yeah, the way, but the, that was yeah, a, but then yeah. Uh, at the end, they're told, oh, because of your pranks, you don't get any dinner. I'm like, woman, they just helped Gamera <laughs> save the world, and you're going to deprive them of dinner? They should be getting merit badges at the very what, least. What? I never got that merit badge when I was a scout. I mean, it, heck, if I had known I could meet Gamera when I was like five, I would be all over that place causing nonsense. Oh, good for you, Jimmy. Uh, he apparently did get an honorary Gamera merit badge later. Uh, we're going to have a talk later, Jimmy. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, this movie's a little bit all over the place. It's hampered by its budget, but it's also, I give it credit, it's trying really hard to be imaginative. And apparently, director Yuasa thought this was going to be the last one, so he was basically just pouring his whole heart and soul into this. And when everybody else was feeling discouraged, he would tell them, it's okay, just keep working hard, this is the last one. It was And then it made money. <laughs> yeah, and then it made money. <laughs> it made a lot of money. It was very successful, actually, in Japan and kids. They had a blast with this one, more so than the last three. And I think part of the reason for that is, for better or for worse, this Gamera movie is more tonally consistent with itself than certainly the first one and even Gauss. And Gauss is my favorite, so it, it hurts to I, say I, that. I would say Gauss was where it finally got its act together tonally. The first two are where the issues were because the first movie couldn't figure out what it wanted to be and Barugan tried to be a serious Toho movie for adults and that went over well. It, although some people really love that one because of that. And then Gauss, like I said, I feel like that's when it figured it out. But this is the first one, like I said, where the kids are the protagonists. Yuasa was still facing some pushback on Gallus, I think. You know, there was still a push to make these films sort of like A-list movies, like Toho's Godzilla movies, right? And mm -hmm. in order to do that, the screenwriter, and I forget the sc screenwriter's name right now, uh, uh, Takahashi, that yes. was, that's his name. He felt that keeping sort of an adult influence into these movies would maximize their audience. Whereas Yuasa, since the very first film, had always been pushing for children's movies. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the big tonal inconsistency with the first film was the fact that we had this annoying kind of crazy child in the first movie. Um, <laughs> Psycho Kenny. <laughs> yeah, juxtaposed with these kind of Toho light characters, right? Mm -hmm. And then Barugan, he didn't even direct. No, he, he was in charge of the for. special effects. Yeah, and that was really just an adult drama with kaiju tossed in there yes and then gauss he returned and was given you know a little more freedom a little more consistency with the child character but the the, the child character was you know they felt he was too young and that he didn't encompass the story enough to really fulfill yuasa's vision virus is yuasa completely unhinged at this point he gives full reign to the children and all he's trying to do is entertain that particular demographic. And I think it worked. What, how many more Gamera films did we get out after this? In Showa or all together? <laughs> in Showa. In Showa. Uh, four we, we more after Giron, this. Jiger, Zegra. And, and Super Monster. <laughs> well, well that mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> <laughs> Mm. So it did a lot. And, and then, of course, they maximized their profits when AIP was like, yep, we want this one. And it's funny because I find this movie more interesting to talk about than to watch, really, because <laughs> it, it, it's fascinating. This was supposed to be the last Gamera movie. And through the magic of stock footage and a lot of ingenuity, I might add, and Yuasa's original plan three movies ago to just make a children's film, it worked. It really, really worked. And if you say it, so, it, it, I almost <laughs> wonder, I almost wonder, you know, if Dae was kind of kicking themselves because they didn't follow through with Yuasa's vision from the very first movie. But Maybe? You know, they, they must have come to their senses with this because they initially asked Yuasa to film two Gamera movies per year. Oh, good grief. <laughs> and he said no. <laughs> because he was a smart man. <laughs> Uh, he said no. And, and to be fair, I think him doing both the dramatic footage and special effects really hurt these movies. 
Mm. I think it was too much because he was really spreading himself thin on this stuff. And this movie was initially supposed to have a final battle that took place in a city where Gamera tossed him into a building mm -hmm. due to the budget cuts that we talked about. They mm -hmm. regulated onto the beach, which yeah. where I think they got a few decent shots yeah. on the beach. I really, really like that one shot under the bridge. Mm -hmm. That was a money Subaraya shot right there. Yeah. Like I said, you can tell that they had the ambition but mm -hmm. they did not have Toho's resources. No, no, and, or manpower. And that's where I, I'm talking about Yuasa being spread thin. I don't think it was a good idea for him to run himself ragged doing both the effects and dramatic footage because I think it suffers there too. Compare it to, he directed the special effects footage for uh, Barugan. Mm -hmm. And look at how well those shots came out. That's true, but he also had more money. That he had a that ton had more the money. biggest budget out of these old yes. movies. He had a ton more money for that movie. But okay, it was <laughs> it was such a, a much larger broad spectrum use of camera angles and resources, I thought, than even the two thirds of what he had of that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I just felt I feel like if someone else ha had taken the reins for special effects. Let me back up here. One of the great failings of Yuasa's Gamera films, I think, is the pacing. Yeah. Okay. And I don't necessarily think that whole scenes, well, except for the stock footage, uh, whole <laughs> scenes should have been cut. But I always feel that maybe he hangs on a shot for too long. Yeah. That's, mm. that's kind of what I got from the movies. Uh -huh. mm. And I hate that. Well, I don't really hate it. You know, I went to school for editing and film. So... To me, I've been raised that way. It's like, okay, this is where you need to cut the shot. And then when when I see it just kind of play on, I'm like, you should have cut it like three minutes ago. Well, I'm just thinking three seconds ago or something like that. Even in the stock footage, I was noticing this in the prior movie, Gamera versus Gauss, where Gamera puts his hand over his shell and like wiggles his fingers to kind of let go of yes. the kid. Yeah, yeah. Which honestly, like if you uh, if you actually pay attention to what is supposed to be going on there, which is Gamma reaching behind his back, it doesn't, the, the composition of the shot is either very weird or it's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I get there was no way Gamera, the actual Gamera suit, could reach behind it. No. <laughs> but but the, the shot works. But I just think it could have been cut like two or three seconds shorter. Mm -hmm. And I almost wonder if because Yuasa is doing both the dramatic and the special effects footage, if he's in the editing room with the editor going, no, 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 keep this as long as... <laughs> <laughs> we have to pad the runtime. Shot. We have to yeah. pad it out. Pad it out. Pad it out. <laughs> we need to hit that theatrical release. Come on. <laughs> it's a lot of power for a single person. Again, this was a short movie in and of itself. And, I, and as far as editing goes, this is probably one of the better ones. Sans stock footage. Um, <laughs> but it's a reoccurring problem with his movies that he just doesn't pace them very well. <laughs> Not unlike what you said about the Snyder Cut, right? <laughs> yeah. <I'm... laughs> At least these come out a lot shorter. Can you imagine a four-hour show a Gamera movie? Good grief. Oh, my God. <laughs> it exists. It's called Super Monster Gamera. <laughs> At least it feels like four hours. Um, Hashtag release the Yuasa Cut? <laughs> no. 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 Uh, no. Uh, um, uh, yes, Jimmy, uh, you can drag me out into the street and shoot me for that one later. No, hmm. So I'm really happy that kids enjoyed these movies because I feel like they're kind of boring sometimes. <laughs> it, it And it's a shame. Maybe it's because I don't really connect with all the characters. Oh, but... you don't connect with Jimmy and his precocious little friend Masao? <laughs> I mean... I mean, according to this movie, I wasn't Jimmy in the Cub is, Scouts, so I. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, were uh, uh, were you guys in Scouts? Because apparently, one of the things that Jimmy learned in the Scouts was uh, was lassoing. I mean, because he does it twice in this movie, right? You know, Jar, were you a, were you a Boy Scout? Unfortunately, I was. Yeah, I, I thought you were. Okay. Uh... <laughs> yeah, lassoing was not top of the list on my learning. <laughs> What about fighting uh, alien squid creatures? Oh, yeah, that uh, was day two. 
Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely sure. You know, we're talking about how this is appealing to kids. And you know what? This is something I actually neglected to mention. And maybe this will help put it into perspective. But there were so many times, every time I've watched this movie, I feel like I'm watching a live action Disney movie from the 60s because it has that <laughs> sort of feel. Back when Disney's live action stuff was not nearly on par with everything else. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all of these little cracks about, you know, like the kids are making all these comments about the grownups, you know, like those really cool anti-grav hallways, which apparently can magically flip you around because you have to dive into it like you're in the Olympics, but then you come out no. feet first on the other side. <laughs> and they try to use Split it and they're like, you. oh, it, pr it probably doesn't work for kids. I'm like, more like it doesn't work for humans. Or, how about <laughs> or it doesn't uh, work for anybody with bone structure. Yeah, uh, apparently. And then there's the little crack about how how the adults get all the cool stuff, basically. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You have a yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, they call the uh, they call the submarine a toy for grown-ups. I'm like, okay, kids, you're not old enough to realize this. Hold on, Jimmy, I'm getting to it. There's only one difference between men and boys. The toys get bigger and more expensive. That is it. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> Is it not? I'm just saying. <laughs> And there's a lot of things in it that are definitely feel like they were filtered through a child's mind. Cause I know Yuasa was definitely wanting to tap into his inner child. I've read interviews of him where he basically said that he learned to distrust adults when he was a kid. So that's why these movies are like they are. And he wanted this to have a fairy tale like structure, which you can definitely tell because mm -hmm. yeah, this definitely seems like a script that might have been dreamed up by a 10 year old kid. I mean, to use more Star Trek comparisons, the Virassian, whatever you call them, ship has replicators that can read your mind. That's yeah. a tiny <laughs> bit freaky, I'm just saying. Although these kids, at least in the subtitles that I had, couldn't decide if it was through telepathy or telekinesis because I'm like, kids, those are two very different things. <laughs> right. <laughs> By the way, Carl Craig said that the juice and the sandwiches that they got uh, as props in that scene were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of figured when they took one sip of it and put it down, I was like, that's probably disgusting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, and also, this is the movie where Gamera gets his famous title of friend to all children given to him mm. by Masao. Oh, he still brags about that to this day? I'm sure, Jimmy. <sighs> yeah. So I guess on one hand, you can't fault it because it embraces the childlikeness of everything. There is a definitely a sense of childlike wonder in this because everything is just so wild and interesting. But as the series progresses, it goes from childlike to childish, I would say. <laughs> Well, I mean, th I think there's still some hits in there. I think uh, Jiger is one of the better of the later ones. And honestly, I don't hate Zegra. <laughs> I don't think it's any more egregious than some of these. <laughs> so than this movie, for example, honestly. And, and I thought they were, worked pretty well with what they had. And that's, you know, that's the game, right? Is they worked well with what they had. They created a pretty dramatic situation and a pretty fun movie with what they had, uh, apart from the stock footage. <laughs> yeah, the stock footage and the implicit virus, the kaiju hentai monster. Uh, 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 kids, you don't want to know. I'm just saying. <laughs> Trust me. Don't ask mom and stay dad. They may not even away know, from but nobody needs to know. Hmm. I've seen enough hentai to know where this is going. <laughs> uh, and it's not. I need to know. <laughs> also is it just me or could it, you potentially say these virasses are kind of supremacists because they literally say all other species in the in the universe are useless i'm just saying yeah i know that too and, and they also like, use wow. and this is a very <laughs> this is a very japanese thing they actually say we are going to make earth our colony that is a very specific kind of language that i think is more particular to japanese alien invasion movies uh-huh yeah, I know that as well, and I'm I'm wondering if there's a translation, not error, but if it could mean possibly. It's just like they say that they come from Mother Star Virus, and for what I understand, because there's a huge error with a lot of the dubs for Giron. Apparently, the Japanese word that they use can be translated either star or planet. 
or Planet Right, which is what happened when people started translating the final film in the Godzilla anime. People thought it was the Star Eater or the Star Killer. So now Star Killer is yeah. another franchise, but <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, it, a lot of the things that are said you have to kind of take in the context of a sentence, like a lot of words in the English language too. Mm-hmm. Which is why I wonder if colonize or colony can also mean something else in the Japanese language. I know we can apply a lot of words to just a single word or phrase or meaning in the Japanese language, and this is probably just one of them. So, mm-hmm. definitely. Oh, well, there is one more thing. I mean, there's a lot that we probably could keep saying about this movie, but one thing I want to make sure that we get in is this is the first movie with that infamous song. <laughs> Camera. <laughs> That I think actually got made more famous or infamous, depending on how you want to look at it, by MST3K. Cameras really be cameras full of me. Cameras. Yes. (laughs) Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, It's not the first Gamera thing, but it's the one everybody knows. And there were actually two written for this movie, but only one showed up, I believe. Am I right? Uh, I don't remember seeing that anywhere, but I wouldn't be surprised. I believe August Ragone mentioned that two were written for it but this was the one that showed up i think the other may have shown up on a another release not a film release but a a soundtrack release or something like that Mm -hmm. possibly Um, although there is one other thing i'm still trying to figure out jimmy how in the heck do you have blonde hair but you have a red-haired mother and a black-haired father oh those actors don't look exactly like your parents okay well creative license sure (laughs) <laughs> oh well the actress that played your mother spot on again just spot on great a actor <laughs> if you like bad uh, adr sure <laughs> i i just that woman sold jim, that scene jim jim I'm my jim acting. see <laughs> <laughs> i have human emotions <laughs> I do want to bring up one part about this movie that I think is done brilliantly. In fact, I would go as far as to say this is the best intro to a Gamera movie. <laughs> Not just in this, in this in the Showa series, but the Heisei series as well. This alien ship, which by the way, I like the Bumblebee design. I really enjoyed it. But this alien ship is kind of monitoring the Earth. And, you know, you can see it kind of twirling its mustache, essentially. <laughs> and... <laughs> We're introduced to the interior with this like crazy kind of like contraption that's lighting up as it talks and whatnot. It's talking about a crew that we don't see, which is kind of unnerving. Yes. And then it mentions how something's, you know, something's outside the ship and we just barely miss Gamera flying by. And then the whole attack sequence was really well done. I love the shot of Gamera's head. Just uh, popping through the wall. Yeah, popping through the wall. And they eject that portion <laughs> he, he's of like the, the ship. Kool- he's like the Kool-Aid man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you guys doing? <laughs> and then he, st- he he gets his head unstuck out of there and goes for the ship proper, trying to escape. And and the, the contraption that's talking, the Earth has a has a protector. Its name is, and then it blows up. <laughs> and then we see the title, Gamera. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll give it that much. And then that after that, so they are good. just, after that, they are just, they're like Saturday morning cartoon villains. They are just obsessed with Gamera. Nothing else can stop them, apparently, from taking over the world. Of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, don't worry about any of the militaries or from around the world. None of that. No, it's just Gamera we need to worry about. It's unfortunate because I feel like the opening of this movie sets up a pace that doesn't quite deliver on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and then the funny thing is that becomes kind of the virus's thing. They send one ship, something bad happens, and then they send a message to the home world. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. means it's kind of like the end of again more star trek it's kind of like the end of conspiracy and tng where the aliens send a message back home so we already know that they can send one message and they'll send another ship does this mean we might be seeing more viruses show up that's a little disconcerting just saying <laughs> But then again, you, you got to wonder, if it destroyed one ship, why would you send just one more? Why not, like, the whole fleet? <laughs> Apparently, Earth is that important. We really don't know why they want Earth outside of the fact they said, it's just like our planet. They're like, what's wrong with yours? Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, you could have at least thrown something in there like, well, our planet is dying. I mean, you know, like in Gigan or something, but, you know, oh, well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, that just looks like more. our planet. We want it. <laughs> it's pretty. <laughs> I like the way it shimmers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like I said, it uses child logic, and which, well, if that's what you're going for, that's what you're going for. That's what this movie was appealing to. I mean, we gotta give this movie a lot of credit, whether we like it or not. This movie extended the show at Gamera series for what, four more movies? Yes. Mm-hmm. Four more movies popularized it even further because this was probably the most popular Gamera movie released uh, of the Showa era. And this is not necessarily a positive, but this is the reason that so much stock footage ended up being used in future Gamera and Godzilla movies. The whole pitch for All Monsters Attack, aka Godzilla's Revenge, was Tomoyuki Tanaka coming up to Sekizawa and asking him, can you write a screenplay where we practically just use stock footage? (laughs) That was the big, you know... (laughs) Pitch yeah. for that movie and the use of stock footage in some cases prolonged Godzilla as well. Godzilla versus Gigan in particular, Godzilla versus Megalon. So it it was the first kaiju movie to really extensively use stock footage to prolong the life cycle of a franchise. Yeah, and at this and, point they had perfected the Gamera formula, which according yeah. to uh, Serenella, who does the commentary with. Carl Craig on the Blu-ray. He actually argues that the Rocky movies copied this formula. I heard that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Which is kind of amusing if you stop and think about it, because Gamera is the second round fighter. Although in this case, it was round two was against virus proper. And the first round was against the ship. But yeah, yeah. But the whole idea is that after the first Rocky movie, it's, oh, I'm going to fight the guy. And then he gets his butt kicked. And then he, you know, three <laughs> training montages later, he wins. So, <laughs> yeah, Adrian, we're going to go after the virus. <laughs> yo, Jake, I'm going to go after the squid. Yo, you know oh, hey, virus, what you doing? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> virus walks up to him and says, I must break you. <laughs> <laughs> I must squeeze you. Camera, uh, it's, camera looks down. No, 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 no. It would form. no. Actually, it would be. I must impale you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so, so. I mean, it, it's funny because this isn't a particularly well-known or very often talked about movie in the kaiju fandom but it really had a massive impact on the next 10 years <laughs> i mean massive a little more than that actually but <laughs> uh, well yeah yeah but the next 10 in particular i mean you know the toho's champion festival was all a children's film festival and what were like the leading movies in that festival for the next few years godzilla yep well, uh, we need to get to the toku topic here pretty soon, but I do have a, at least a few notes here that I'd like to mention. As usual, I never get through them all. Yes, Jimmy, more material for your blogs. I get it. So, one of the things that I did want to mention, since we talked about the submarine, interestingly, this submarine was manufactured by a German company called HUW, which made U-boats in World War II. <laughs> Because it was a real functioning submarine, and apparently it was barely seaworthy. But it was uh, you know, seaworthy. <laughs> <laughs> the problem just, was that it was only I saw bare. that, and I was like, did they just pull that out of a Cracker Jack box, or what, what's going on here? Uh, it makes you wonder. Also, uh, just a funny little idiom that I saw doing my research was Carl Craig said that those three girls that were there, uh, they were apparently scoutmasters or something. He said that him and the actor who played Masao were about 11 years old, and those girls were 19 and 20. He said that hanging out with them on set was fringe benefits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jimmy, of course you wouldn't complain. <sighs> you, yeah, where, you'll where bring, are those you, in my scout troop? Yeah. Well, and you know what? You know, it's a li- something that I've been noticing with a lot of these Gamera movies, because I know most of these, if not all of them, were written by the same guy. He must have a thing for having little boys with overbearing big sisters. Uh, that's just a thing that I've been noticing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever floats your, 
U boat. <laughs> Yay, I got one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, apparently it's bragging rights now to come on my show and get a sad trombone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it, those every episode. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, you're welcome to. <sighs> hmm, hmm. Well, on that happy note, let's move on to the Toku topic. Hi, this is Eric Anderson from Nerd Chapel. Nerd Chapel is all about bridging the gap between nerd culture and the church. This is done by an online and social media presence, a physical presence at comic, anime, and gaming conventions, and with tabletop game nights in Spring Lake, Michigan. I've also co-written two devotionals for nerds and geeks with Nathan Marchand, 42 Discovering Faith or Fandom, and the new 42 God Terraforms All Things. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and please explore the website nerdchapel.com for more information. Like I said, about the only thing of substance that we could get out of this movie, and at least in my opinion, is talking about the Scout Association of Japan. Now, the two of you have already mentioned that both of you have been in the Boy Scouts, which was actually something I was going to ask if either of you were in Boy Scouts, because I was not. <laughs> no, I was not. Oh, you weren't. Okay, so no, it's just I was JR. not. Okay. I was JR the only is the lone warrior soul. here. I was the only poor soul drug into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fine, Jimmy. Take credit for helping me with the research on this, or rather your own personal experience. I get it. I get it. I get it. Because, you know, as we saw in this dramatization of a very exciting chapter of your life, apparently, yes, you were in the Japanese Boy Scouts. For what I understand, though, they used a real Boy Scout jamboree for those extras, and those mm -hmm. were real authentic uniforms that they gave to Carl Craig. Although I think I heard him say that the uniform he got was a little bit different because the uniform they gave him was for expatriate members of the Scouts because he was a military brat. He's actually from South Carolina. His dad is Japanese and his mother is American or it's the other way around, actually, I think. So he was stationed there, and that's basically what led to him getting the role because they needed a okay. Caucasian-looking kid who could speak Japanese. <laughs> because they were mandated to have a Caucasian kid in this movie if they were going to get help from AIP, which was about the only way this movie was going to get made. Right. And also, despite that, this was not officially sanctioned by the Scout Association of Japan, but Yuasa did a little promotional film for them, which you can watch part of on the Arrow Blu-rays. So I guess they got something of a repayment. <laughs> what, 50 plus years later? Well, no, it was uh, <laughs> right before the movie, but yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the Scout Association of Japan. This was started in 1922 with boys only as Boy Scouts of Japan until 1971. And then they, there's a couple of different name changes for this thing. The first one was they changed it to Boy Scouts of Nippon, and that's what it was from 1971 to 1995. But then in 1995, it became co-educational. So they ended up going with Scout Association of Japan because it was gender neutral. It was founded by, this is interesting, Count Futara Yoshinori and Viscount Mishima Michiharu, who later served as the chief scout of Japan. And as of May 2017, it has 99,779 members, although that was the first time it dropped below 100,000 since the 60s. So Ooh. you may know this, JR. I don't know how much uh, you know about the history of the Boy Scout organization as a whole, but did you know that it was started in 1907 in Britain? I did know that. Did you? Do you remember the name of the I founder? Don't, I, I don't know how I remember it, but I do, <laughs> do you, know it. Do you remember the name of the founder? Uh, no. not uh, Lord Robert Baden-Powell. I'm naming my first kid that. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> scouting was introduced to Japan in 1909 by Ambassador Akizuki Satsuo and a teacher named Hojo Tokiyuki, who had just visited England in 1908. But... The troop he started at the school he worked at dissolved after he left the school. 
And then Scouting for Boys was translated and published in Japan in 1910, but none of the troops that people tried to form after that really stayed together. They lacked cohesion because they didn't quite understand what Scouting was. And then didn't the understand what Scouting was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't know what it is. <laughs> Oh, good for you, Jimmy. You still know what it means. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. You got that lasso merit badge you want to bring in next time we record? Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But uh, the first recognized Boy Scout troop in Japan formed in 1912 in Yokohama, but it was mainly British boys and other foreigners. (laughs) It was led by merchant Clarence Griffin. That's about as British a name as you can get. (laughs) <laughs> who was recognized as Japan's first scoutmaster. But in 1918, it went international and was the first group registered in the World Scout Bureau in 1923, and it remains active to this day. In 1920, Richard Suzuki, the son of a British mother and a Japanese father, carried the Japanese flag during the Procession of Nations at the first World Scout Jamboree in London. So that's a notable first. That same year, Prince Hirohito, who later became Emperor Showa, visited Britain and experienced scouting firsthand and hoped it would take hold in Japan. Aw, there you go. (laughs) And then we have another count, another Japanese count getting involved with the scouts here. Count Goto Shimpei, who was Minister of Railways during the 1923 Kanto earthquake, which if you want to learn some more about that, listen to my episode, I think it's episode 33 on Submersion of Japan. He promoted scouting in his spare time because he was named the first chief scout of Japan. Now, there's a few other things that happened in the 20s and 30s with scouting, but the next major thing that happened is, you would expect, World War II kind of ruined everything for them. (laughs) Just a bit. Yeah, and the occupation didn't help a whole lot either, unfortunately. Scouting was actually banned during the war because it was seen as a Western assault on Japanese values. Oh, really? Yeah. That's actually very interesting. Yeah. While others actually saw it as part of Japan's modernization process, which actually was a big thing at the time, starting in the Meiji era, was the modernization of Japan. But it really got kicked into high gear after the war. It didn't help that ex-military officers were blacklisted by American forces at this time, and that's where a lot of the adult involvement with scouting came from. Hmm. Participant patches were printed on paper due to poor finances, and scouting memorabilia from this time is very rare and it's highly prized. But Japan was readmitted as a full member of the World Organization of Scout Movement in 1950, and within 10 years of the war, it grew to 80,000 members. So it bounced back pretty good. A few That's more. It. What? Oh, I, was, I was just going to say, you're making this sound a lot more interesting than me <laughs> sitting in the dirt trying to rub two sticks together. <laughs> <laughs> That's because... <laughs> That is a good point, Jimmy. That's because you were in the American Scouts and not the Japanese Scouts. (laughs) True. I mean, they did play with submarines. What am I thinking? (laughs) Yeah, don't we all wish we could do that? (laughs) But a few more historical notes here. In 1961, Viscount Michiharu Mishima was the first Japanese to be awarded the Bronze Wolf. Do you know what the Bronze Wolf is? Apparently, it seems like it's some sort of Boy Scout thing, but I'm not sure what it is. Sounds like a Power Ranger. It does sound like a Power Ranger. (laughs) But this award is given by the World Scout Committee for Exceptional Services to World Scouting. Huh, I've never heard of that. Okay. In 1971, Boy Scouts of Japan hosted three major World Scouting events, which included the 13th World Scout Jamboree and the first World Scout Forum in Shizuoka and the 23rd World Scout Conference in Tokyo. So they were very busy that year. And also, as I've already kind of mentioned in 1971, they changed their name. So it wasn't... Here's the interesting thing, and I didn't quite realize this. You know how I said they changed it from Boy Scouts of Japan to Boy Scouts of Nippon? Mm -hmm. That's because the word Japan is not Japanese. The word Japan actually comes from a southern Chinese dialect, which Marco Polo heard as Zipang, and then it eventually became Japan in English. Well, all right then. Yeah, but Nippon is what the Japanese call the country. All right. Well, you know, good for us for screwing something else up. (laughs) Well, yeah, uh, there's some jokes there, but they would probably be a little inappropriate. So (laughs) (laughs) 
at least <laughs> insensitive, just a tiny bit. But in 1995, when it went co-educational, it was decided that the proper national name, Nippon, was not well-known enough worldwide. But in the original charter, Boy Scouts of Japan, or Nippon, is still used in the writing of the Japanese language Scouts Constitution. So they decided that it would be the official name in the Japanese language, and the English expression was to be used for convenience with overseas scouts. <laughs> <laughs> convenient <laughs> yes <laughs> yes and according to uh, one of my sources quote an exchange program between japanese scouts and the boy scouts of america was started in 1998 at the suggestion of then prime minister ryutaro hashimoto in a 1996 meeting with president bill clinton so you could have, if you, I guess if you were a, a scout in America, you could have participated in an exchange program and gone to Japan. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> My one chance I missed it. <laughs> hey, you're here on Ogasawara now. You're okay. It's true. <laughs> you get to hang out with monsters now. That's very true. <laughs> yes. I got to go visit Gamera. <laughs> yes, everybody comes to visit Gamera because the board made him the new king of the monsters. Another thing I found in my sources, uh, quote, the aim of the Scout Association of Japan is to help young people become responsible humanitarian citizens who can appreciate and practice loyalty, courage, and self-respect in an international perspective. With the support of volunteer leaders, the Scout movement in Japan provides fun-filled, challenging programs with an emphasis on developing each young person's character, health, abilities, and sense of service to others, end quote. Well, that's why Jack can't be a scout. <laughs> yeah, I, sometimes I wonder how Jimmy could be a scout. Oh, calm down, man. I riff because I love. Anyway, the motto for the Japanese scouts is Sonayo Suneni, which means be prepared. <laughs> mm -hmm. wonder if that's how that's a lot the... more impressive over there. <laughs> I wonder if that's how they translate the Lion King song. <laughs> Uh, but uh, interestingly, the uh, if you look up the emblem for the Japanese scouts, it incorporates the sacred mirror Yata no Kagami. Have you guys heard of that? If you've heard, I did an episode about it, episode 13 on the three treasures. So I talked about it a little bit in there. It's one of the s three sacred treasures of Japan. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds familiar. Yeah. And you just brought it up. That's mm -hmm. probably why I've heard it. Yeah. And to them, it represents wisdom and honesty. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, unlike in America, scouts are encouraged but not required to believe in God. In fact, it actually says on the official English language website for Scout Association of Japan, they're open to any religion, which honestly seems like a very Japanese sort of attitude, especially if you understand Shinto, which, again, you can learn about that listening to my Return of Daimajin episode, because Shinto is pretty open to a lot of different ideas. So, there's different sections of uh, Japanese Boy Scouts. I'll run through them really quick. You start with, and you can let me know if that, how close this might be to American Scouting, JR. But level one is the Beaver Scouts, which is ages six to eight. And then we have Cub Scouts, which is age eight to 11. Yes, which is what you and Masao were at during the Great Virus Invasion of 1968, apparently. Then we have Boy Scouts, which is 11 to 14, Venture Scouts from 14 to 20, and then we have Rover Scouts from age 18 to 24. Okay, so if I remember correctly, it goes Cub Scouts, Tiger Scouts, Wee Below, Boy Scouts, and then Eagle Scouts. That sounds about right. It sounds, I'm trying to remember like ranking and uniform, but I think that's right. Okay. Well, each section has a different motto. Now, keep in mind, these are translations from Japanese and different sources I looked at had slightly different translations, but these are the ones that I went with. The Cub Scout motto is always be in high spirits. Beaver Scout motto is just friendly. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you find that funny. So, I just What's your motto? Friendly. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, and then uh, we keep things simple in Japan. <laughs> well, I, I just remember, like, the, the one thing I do remember is going to these meetings after school. And when the group was announced, you'd have to say your motto. So I just can imagine, hey, Beaver Scouts, what's yours? Friendly. 
<laughs> Dang it. Here's the other thing. They have mottos and they also have oaths. Or okay. the younger ones have promises. They're not oaths, apparently. So for Beaver and Cub Scouts, it's this. On my honor, I promise to do my best to do my duty to God or Buddha. It depends on, I guess, where your religious beliefs are. And the country. And to obey the scout laws to help other people at all times and to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. You just brought years of PTSD back to me. <laughs> Right. And then the, there's also one that's, I guess, specifically Beaver Scouts. $1,200 down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's another one that's specifically Beaver Scouts. It says, I will be friendly to everyone and protect the Beaver Scout law. There you go. And then the uh, Cub Scout promises, I promise to behave honestly and steadily and to follow the pack laws. Oh, did you want to know what the pack laws are? Sure. Here you go. <laughs> there's five of them. You got... Cub Scouts obey, Cub Scouts look after themselves, Cub Scouts work together, Cub Scouts help younger ones, Cub Scouts do good deeds. Yeah, that, that, mm. do they? <laughs> <laughs> Not Cub when Scouts sell more popcorn. Yeah. Also, uh, Scout Laws. I should have mentioned that, you know, because they talked about the Scout Laws and their oath or promise, whatever. Uh, here are those. A scout is faithful, a scout is friendly, a scout is courteous, a scout is kind, a scout is cheerful, a scout is thrifty, okay, a scout is courageous, and a scout is thankful. And a scout is afraid of Boo Radley. <laughs> yes! <laughs> An episode of MIFE would not be complete without a classic literature reference. <laughs> there are also ranks within all of these. Now, I found different sources that had different ones, but the ones that I found most often were, and I have it in both English and Japanese, that you have tenderfoot or shokiyu, second class or nikiyu, first class or ikiyu, and chrysanthemum or kiku. Yeah, I don't, can't say I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that might be a little bit specific, but also, uh, I'm sure you remember merit badges? Oh, God, yes. Well, there are 72 merit badges in the in uh, Japanese scouts, and you might be amused to find out what some of those skills are. Please, DDR. Dance no, Dance no, there is no DDR, unfortunately. No, it's a oh. traditional skill such as Japanese fencing, sumo wrestling, judo, and strawcraft. I really wish I was part of the Japan scouts now. <laughs> I got fishing. <laughs> oh, what was that, Jimmy? Oh, you were really good at getting the judo merit badge, I'm sure. Hey, Jimmy, let's hop in a ring and test my sumo wrestling. Uh, that's a challenge, buddy. Come on at me. All right, hey, enough, you two, okay? <laughs> you watch your mouth. You don't talk about my comic book collection that way. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, he's like, I, wait, I can't say mother. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she knows where I was going with that. Oh, jeez. Oh my gosh! At this point, I mean, uh, uh, Jimmy, you do realize that Jr.'s tag team partner is here, right? Challenge accepted. Good grief, man! Uh, uh, you know what? Jet Jaguar hits like a three-year-old. You can tell him I said that. He's here <laughs> in the booth, you idiot. He just popped that. right up as soon as you said that. Hey, no idea we'll we'll you take had this that. outside later. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the producer was this practically sidekick central. We have this hierarchy, you know? There's me, then Jimmy, then Jet, because Jet is Jimmy's sidekick, and Jimmy is my sidekick. I mean, it's... Hmm. Yes, but we do have a Jaeger outside. Yeah, this yeah. is true. And unfortunately, with all of these weird singular point mods that Jet's been doing with himself, he can't grow to giant size anymore to fight your robot. So Exactly. That's unfortunate. That's the Japanese Cub Scout motto. Always be prepared. <laughs> Wasn't that what they say in America, too? <laughs> yes. That's just the more accurate translation. It's always stay strapped is actually. There the, uh... you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about Cub Scouts. I figured I'd bring yes. that old reference. Also, since we're talking about awards, you know how I was saying that poor Jimmy and Masao got deprived of dinner despite helping Gamera save the world? Well, I want to believe, and Jimmy, you can confirm this if you want, because there are awards that are given to Japanese scouts 
Very prestigious ones, apparently. The highest one that you can earn is the Golden Pheasant. <laughs> which is suspend which is uh Sorry. <laughs> what? The, the golden, golden what? pheasant. That's what it says. The okay. Kiji show in Japanese, apparently. Uh, it's suspended from a white ribbon with two red stripes. Oh, that's good to know, Jimmy. You and myself both got one. It took them a month to give it to you, though? Oh, that's unfortunate. Well, these things do move slowly. Yes. And then the second highest award is the Silver Eagle. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which is, more impressive. which is suspended from a white ribbon with two green stripes. And then the third highest award you can get, apparently they love colors and birds. Uh, by the way, the Takasho is the Japanese word for Silver Eagle Award. The third highest award you can get is the Silver Cuckoo. <laughs> That's not very respectable. <laughs> In Japanese, it is Kakasho. That is much more respectable. <laughs> it's suspended from a white ribbon with two yellow stripes. Mm-hmm. So which one would uh, which one would you guys rather have? Would you rather be a golden pheasant, a silver eagle, or a silver cuckoo? <laughs> I just want to say I'm a golden pheasant. So <laughs> I think I think Jack would be uh, correct in naming me a uh, what was it a cuckoo? <laughs> Actually, now that I think about it, all of these sound like they could be Power Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> I really you want imagine that, that. You, that sounds like a, a Super Sentai gimmick waiting to happen, doesn't it? You know, it's a, they're all a bunch of Boy Scouts. <laughs> what? All right. So what was what was it again? Golden Golden Pheasant, Silver Pheasant. Eagle, and Silver Cuckoo. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's more for time. Silver Cuckoo. <laughs> you know what? I think I'd almost pay for that. <laughs> I think well, I could get behind. I mean, they do have they do I'm have glad the someone uh, will Saban won't. <laughs> Saban doesn't own Power Rangers anymore. Uh, that's right. It's Hasbro. Hasbro does. Yeah. Well, Hasbro I mean, definitely they did, won't. The Sentai did have a uh, red, or no, a yellow owl. I guess Cuckoo's not too far off. Oh, they did, didn't they? Yeah, it was like uh, yeah. it was like no, it was a Go Buster. It's like Jet Buster or something like that. <laughs> Moving on. So my last quick little point here, because most of my notes on this are just lists. A few notable scouts for you. Ryutaro Hashimoto, who was the 82nd and 83rd Prime Minister of Japan. Yukio Hattori, the 5th President of the Hattori Nutrition College and, and a commentator on the Japanese cooking competition show Iron Chef. Soichi Noguchi, who was a Japanese astronaut. Oh, you're friends with him? Of course you are, Jimmy. You are Jimmy from NASA, after all. And then also Makoto Raiku, who's a manga artist, who's most famous for creating Zatch Bell. Oh, no way. That's a show. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I've never Can't seen it. It's a good show, but it's a show. <laughs> and then one that I will confess is near and dear to my heart. Ha, ha, ha. I got it. The ne- he well, said the thing. Yeah, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I'm talking about the next one, not Zatch Bell. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, no, the the near and dear to our heart. We maybe make fun of ourselves for saying that all the time. Oh, I make fun of okay. you for saying that all the time. I said I it like twice, all- okay? <laughs> anyway, Shigeru Miyamoto, the famous Japanese video game designer who works for Nintendo. He was a scout. Nice. Yes, and obviously Jimmy from NASA and his friend Masao. I guess we have to mention that again. Look at me, I'm Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. There you go. A bunch of... St- uh, consider yourselves educated. You now know more about boys... Uh, not just Boy Scouts, but you know, scouting in Japan than you did before. Congratulations. Huzzah. Thank you. <sighs> Are we happy now? I hope we're happy now. <laughs> All right, now that we've gotten that out of the way, it is now time to move on to. All right, Nate, Nate, Nate uh, I gotta, I, I gotta interrupt you real quick. I'm, oh. I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> okay, I'm let you finish. I mean, it is my show. I'm just saying. But uh, Gamera versus Virus had the best stock footage of all time, <laughs> all uh-huh. time. But I, I gotta get going here, Jr. I'm gonna take the Jaeger if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Is I... that all right? I'll find a way home. I have some work I need to get to back home. Maybe you can take one of those. 
flying ejection buildings that Jimmy, Jimmy was so fond uh, of. Yeah, yeah. Though... How, uh, how about no? Uh, you know, so... <laughs> oh, well, that's very generous of you, Jimmy. He says you can borrow the Tyranodon bot. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, that's hilarious. All right, well, I'm going to take the Jaeger. Thank you for having me on the episode. Love talking about Gamma versus Virus. Yeah. You guys enjoy the rest of your time, and I will see you later. All right, yeah, well, uh, just don't drink any more of the Gamma or Kool-Aid on the thing on your way back. Best stock footage ever, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take care, guys. All, All right, right. Let it do. thanks a lot. Okay, so, JR, it's uh, just you and me finishing out the episode so, I think our next segment will be some listener. Really, Jimmy? Really? Must I? Uh, yeah, you're right. Contractual obligations. All right, fine. What little memo do I have from the board today? With COVID-198 on the D- decline, you are pleased to... And- Bunsi the Monster Island Board of Director will be lifelong to restrictions on tea usage of masks on our island home. Tis a please to any and all volunteers. Humans and Kiju living and working on Monster Island stirred in immediately. Are you okay? Do I'm, I need to I'm, get I'm, you I'm reading like a that, sedative? I'm reading this verbatim. I don't know if the board is on cocaine or if someone typed out a fat finger text I, I message. I do need to bite down on something. I yeah. just. Oh, yeah, it's, like I said, it might be a fat finger text message or something. Uh, apparently, this I, was not sent to Miss Perkins because she would have proofread the snot out of this. I, I feel I, like I, I seriously I had to slip into <laughs> like a Monty Python voice to it read sounded that. Like German. Yeah, it wasn't German. Uh, it was John Cleese. That was a voice that John Cleese would do on Monty ah, Python. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's even a follow up to this. This is a uh, Funkle you for he. Fin a butter way for Ward. Wow. Thought he was going to say buttered toast there for a minute. Yeah, uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Seriously, guys, my dear Orwellian overlords, you might want to let Miss Spe- Perkins do a little bit more editing for you. I'm just uh, saying. Spell check. Yeah. Please, uh, just, uh, spell check please. is a thing. Spell check Ta- is a thing. Curtis. You might want to turn that to uh, uh, that or uh, you know something like Oh, what's that spelling service that uh, you can get that's supposed to be like spell check on steroids? Uh, Grammarly. Yeah, you need to install Grammarly onto your tablet when you're passing that around and typing all this stuff out and just a little bit of friendly advice. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Just common courtesy. Yeah, definitely, definitely, because I don't, yeah, that hurt my brain a little bit. Yeah, I think it hurt. What little brain I have left, it hurts. Yeah, I think what they're trying to say is they're relaxing the mask mandate on the island. Oh, think that's what they're saying? I certainly hope so. Because, yeah, that's been a little bit obnoxious. I don't like sounding like Bane and looking like Scorpion. (laughs) I have to admit, like, it's really annoying when I'm at work and there is, I see everybody coming in and they're still wear, wearing masks and some people aren't wearing masks. I'm like, I know by law I'm required to wear this while I'm working, but I can't understand you. Yes. Trust me. That's uh, been a little bit of a hassle around here. Yeah. <sighs> but that being the case, I also want to make sure I go over a little bit of listener feedback. I've Got a small pile of it that I need to get through. This one is actually a little bit different. These are actually very in-depth comments on a past episode on the podcast YouTube channel. And these come to us from Adam Noyes, who was a guest host on the episode about Submersion of Japan. He was leaving some comments on episode 34. He begins by saying, Did someone say history burst through the wall like Kool-Aid Man? (laughs) <laughs> which is appropriate because we did talk about Kool-Aid Man very briefly today because apparently Gamera is a part-time Kool-Aid Man. Why not? Mm-hmm. 
And then he goes on. This is on episode 34, which is Gamera versus Barugan. The Japanese ideals for making the Greater East Asia Coke prosperity sphere were mainly to cast out the influence of quote-unquote Western imperialism. Ironically, this led to economic collapse for most of Asia because they relied on exports and imports from particularly the U.S. to keep the economies afloat. Once removed, there was only so much demand from Japan, and suddenly a lot of those resources, usually exported without any problem, would just sit and rot. Because I was talking in part in that episode about the New Guinea campaign and the economics that made the New Guinea campaign during World War II a thing. He goes on. On the other hand, Japan was so barbaric towards most of these nations, including their only ally, Thailand, that even if these nations were open to the prospect of being more independent and self-sufficient, doing it at the hands of the Japanese instantly soured any notion. To be clear, the Japanese were barbaric in how they treated their occupied territories. Like, I'd argue it often put what the Nazis did to shame. There were no, quote-unquote, racial justifications or rhyme or reason like we unfortunately saw in Europe. In Asia, the atrocities were just acts of utter madness and cruelty. And the fact Japan refuses to acknowledge these to this day, unlike Germany, is beyond deplorable. Yeah, it is still an issue, let me tell you. We've talked about that a few times on the show, this idea of forgetting history and maybe even some revisionist history at points. It still remains controversial in Japan. And then he had one more comment. I must disagree with the comparison with Japan and New Guinea with Germany and the Soviet Union. The better comparison is Japan and China. To both, it was a battle of survival, a war unlike any other ever fought in human history. One cannot coexist with the other. It's insane. Glad you guys are listening to Supernova in the East. I adore it. That was the title of an episode of the Hardcore History Podcast. Okay, right on. Which, uh, if you want epic episodes of podcasts, though, there's that. Uh, it's on average four <laughs> to five hours per episode. As wow. the guy uh, says on that podcast, he is addicted to context. <laughs> All right. I might have to check it out. Yeah, definitely worth it. Adam is great for stuff like that because he pours over history about as much as I do, if not more so, <laughs> when it comes <laughs> to researching for this podcast. I mean, do what you do, man. Mm -hmm. Do what you love. Mm -hmm. All right, JR, I hope you're ready for this because it's now time for a very important segment on the show, the Patreon shoutouts. It's Morphin' Time! Go show Michael Hamilton! Danny Domenoff! Eli Harris! Damon Norris! Chris Cook! Travis Alexander! Bex from Redeemed Otaku! Bam! <laughs> that is way too much fun. It is. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing that for my outro on the drift space. I'm not even gonna tell anybody. <laughs> Who are you gonna shout out? <laughs> I'm gonna shout out my own name. And I'm JR! Uh, uh, oh, you no, know, you gotta go like J R <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just use what JR stands for. I don't care. I don't even uh, know what we're JR not, stands We're not saying that. No. <laughs> oh, Those okay. are evil no. words. <laughs> very well. Very well. Got it. Got it. Got so it's, it. Like, it's like referring to Belial as my father. We're not doing that. <laughs> Jimmy says he's going to figure it out. Oh, I dare you. Apparently that is another challenge accepted. Oh, well, maybe I should back off. I forgot Jack left. Apparently, you were coming perilously close to getting added to his rogues gallery. I am feeling very threatened right now. Jimmy, need you need to stop this, okay? I don't need you making enemies of all of my guests. Or did you forget what happened with you and Joy last season? Okay, fine. We won't speak of it. Well, I did beat cancer. Jimmy couldn't be too much harder. That is true. He did cheat death. And I can do it multiple times. <laughs> okay, enough children. 
<sighs> All right. But uh, before we finish out the episode, I need to make sure to let everyone know what our next episodes are going to be. As I've already hinted at, I have to do two of these Gamera movies in a row. So the next episode will be Gamera versus Giron, which might be one of the arguably most well-known of the Gamera movies, at least thanks to MST3K, because uh, <laughs> one word, gymnastics. <laughs> <sighs> ah, there's your king of the monsters turtle. folks just saying and i will be joined by luke giaconetti he's coming back ladies and gentlemen luke giaconetti of the earth destruction directive podcast and i will also be joined by avowed misty greg meyer who as far as i know is on at least one or two of his own podcasts most of them having to do with superheroes we'll find out a little bit more when he comes on and then I will be returning to my little series of minisodes, minisodes in air quotes, on the Toho Classics, although this will be my last one in that series. And it will be the very strange, not kaiju movie, but it is Tokusatsu, Sayonara Jupiter from 19, I believe it's 83 or 84. I've heard some interesting things about it to say the least and i will be joined by alex cornett and eric neely from the monsters vs. men podcast well just to let everybody know you are now about to hear the shameless self-promotion because editing is wonderful and we had to do things a little bit out of order well nathan you know it's been amazing being here at monster island i'm going to take a quick run around the island maybe get a few selfies if you don't mind Oh, you're more than welcome to. Just don't make the same mistake as that couple in GMK. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course not. They were idiots. All right. So before I go, I think I should call my ride. Marveler! So with all of that out of the way, no episode of the Monster Island Film Vault would be complete without shameless self-promotion. Take it away, gentlemen. Hi, well, I'm Jack. You can find me on Twitter at Gman of Mysteroid, and you can check out my Substack called "Deferential Wrath of a Rusting Markalite Cannon," which is real, and he is the it, it, he, he continues to be the only person with the right opinions about Tokusatsu. <laughs> Correct. So go read him. Go read him at markalite.substack.com. And I am the ever so humble Jr. I have an Instagram where I just do little cosplays that I feel are interesting at Little Man Cosplay, and I too also have a Twitter. Little man underscore says one. And we are, in fact, the Drift Space. You can take a look at our show at bit.ly slash TDS links. And you can find us on all your favorite podcatchers. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at the Drift Space. We love interacting with people. And always stay strapped. strapped. And with that, Jimmy, cue credits. Thank you for listening to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast produced and hosted by Nate Marchand. If you enjoy the show and want to join the discussion, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Your message could be read on a future episode of the show. Our website is monsterislandfilmvault.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Monster Island Film Vault and on Twitter, where our handle is at the Monster Isla one you can also follow Jimmy from NASA on Twitter at NASA Jimmy and the Monster Island Board of Directors at Monster Isla BOD. I have fulfilled my contractual obligations! And be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, and Twitch. The podcast logo was created by Tyler Souls from TylerDrawsComics.com. Our theme song is Wanderer on the Offensive Live Edit by B33J, Sarax, Juan Madrano, and Nonsensical Lexus, which is a remix of Counterattack, Battle with the Colossus, and The Open Way, Battle with the Colossus by Koatani from the video game Shadow of the Colossus. All film and audio clips belong to the respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and or Podchaser to spread the word about the show. You can also support us by joining MIFV Max on Patreon, the Monster Island Film Vault is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production. Sayonara!